The Best of Our Knowledge explores topics on learning, education, and research. Coming up, the April 8th solar eclipse will be a once-in-a-lifetime experience for millions. We'll meet students who are using balloons to study the celestial event. And what's better than a sturdy pair of shoes? Horseshoes, that is. We'll learn about a program that is educating future farriers. I'm Lucas Willard, host of The Best of Our Knowledge. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. The 2024 total solar eclipse will bring unique opportunities for scientific research across America. And to learn about how students are participating in a national study, I visited the University at Albany in New York. During the April 8th solar eclipse, students at UAlbany's Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences are participating in NASA's nationwide eclipse ballooning project. While huddled at Fort Drum near Watertown, New York, students will be launching weather balloons equipped with small battery-powered devices called radiosons. As the balloons soar 100,000 feet above the Earth in the path of totality, they will transmit real-time atmospheric data, which will be compared to conditions on the ground. Less than a week before launch day, UAlbany professor Justin Minder pauses to explain the flurry of activity inside a loading dock. This is kind of one of our last dry runs, getting the students practicing, going through all the steps of, of preparing the balloon, preparing the instrumentation, preparing the computers. We're setting up a weather station out in the parking lot to give us extra context um, for, the, for the data. So there's lots of steps that you got to do right to get, really, to get really good data. And then we're going to be doing this every hour um, leading up to and, and after the eclipse for about 24 hours. So we want to have a well-oiled, uh, you know, scientific machine. Ahead of today's test run, UAlbany senior Kelly Geiger is making final adjustments. Right now we are setting up the parachute, which will be connected to the radio sound, which is what we're going to be launching up into the atmosphere. And so right now we're working on tying everything together, making sure everything is secure so the radio sound doesn't fall when we launch up. Sean White, a senior atmospheric science major, says the National Eclipse Research Study is his first time taking part in a field campaign. A lot of the stuff that we get to learn and get to experience here is just something that you just can't experience when just sitting in a classroom looking at maps and looking at data that already has been collected. You get to see and experience the entire process that, process that is behind all the data collection. John Carlos Pena, a second-year graduate student, is also excited to be involved. Radiosons and weather balloons are like very core to atmospheric science. People have been launching them for like a century now. Um, and it, you can still learn so much about it, so it's cool to see and learn about such a rare opportunity. The research is as much a scientific field project as it is a lesson in cooperation. In the parking lot behind UAlbany's E-Tech building, Peering at a laptop screen under a pop-up tent, senior Alan Birnbaum is working with others to determine how much helium needs to be used to inflate the rubber balloon. So if we put in too little, the balloon won't go up. If we put in too much, it'll burst um, way lower than what we need it to be. Because this balloon should hopefully go up to about 30, 35 kilometers, which is about like 18, or like 20, maybe 21 miles up. And then, with the details ironed out, it's time to inflate. Now the size of a small car, the balloon will be the size of a small school bus when it reaches its apex. And then, as the rain falls, the balloon is ready for its rise. The large white balloon carrying its small battery-powered device clears the E-Tech building and heads for the clouds. The team is ready for the eclipse. You're listening to the best of our knowledge. Depending on where you are on April 8th, you might have a once-in-a-lifetime chance to experience a total solar eclipse. Its arrival is leading to solar tourism, bringing in visitors from around the country who want to see it for themselves, it's also a chance for scientists to expand their understanding, and one person who will be watching closely is Dr. Valerie Rapson, a physics and astronomy professor at SUNY Oneonta in upstate New York. 
Dr. Rapson spoke with WAMC's Ian Pickus. We are super excited. So I'm going to be hanging out down in Oneonta, which is a little bit outside of totality, but we're going to have a, a big event at our science center, as I'm sure pretty much every science center across New York State is going to do. And uh, we're just going to help all of the local people safely watch the eclipse. I have a bunch of basic questions for you, so bear with me. Sure. When we say you know, a total solar eclipse. What do we mean by that? Yeah, we mean that the the moon is going to appear to move in front of the sun from our perspective and essentially block out the sun's light. So if you are in totality, then the moon is going to completely cover up the sun from your perspective. And if you're outside of totality, you'll get a partial eclipse where the moon only blocks part of the sun, not the whole thing. And so the Earth is a, a relatively big place. So the rarity here is not necessarily the moon going in front of the sun. It's that in this part of the world, we're going to see the full thing. Right, exactly. We generally get uh, about two solar eclipses a year, but that's in various locations across the world. So it's much more rare to have a path cross the United States uh, and also to have it cross so many populated cities and areas. That's why people are so excited about this one is that it's not only crossing the United States, but it's crossing over a huge populated area of our country. So a lot of people are going to get to enjoy it very easily. Uh, it kind of can hurt your head a little bit to to try to picture why this happens. But obviously the, the sun is so far away. The moon is very close, astronomically speaking. Why does yeah. an eclipse happen? Yeah, so we are very lucky in that nature gave us these two objects that are at just the right size and distance so that we can have an eclipse. So you're right. The, the moon is a lot closer to us and it's a lot smaller, but the sun is bigger and also farther away. The sun's about 400 times larger, uh, but 400 times farther away than the moon is. So because of these numbers, it actually works out that both objects appear to be the same size in the sky. So the moon can actually cover up the sun if things line up just right so that that path crosses. What happens at this moment that we've been hearing so much about totality? Yeah, totality is when the moon completely covers up the sun, and that gives us a really unique view of the solar corona, essentially this very thin but also very, very hot atmosphere that surrounds the sun. And normally it's too faint for our, our telescopes on the ground or our eyes to see, um, but during a total solar eclipse, we actually get to see this outer layer, which generally isn't visible. So that's the main exciting thing we're all looking forward to uh, when totality hits. And so what's the difference between a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse from the viewer's perspective? Yeah, so a solar eclipse has the order of sun, moon, earth, and it's the moon that's moving between the earth and the sun and blocking out the sun's light. A lunar eclipse is when the earth is in the middle. So the order becomes sun, earth, and moon, and it's actually the moon that moves behind the earth and passes in the earth's shadow. And that uh, darkened shadow causes most of the light that hits the moon to disappear. And we usually get it to look not completely dark, but a little bit of that blood red color. Uh, and that has to do with the little bit of light that actually makes it to the moon is light that has already passed through Earth's atmosphere. So the atmosphere has scattered the blue light and only a little bit of red light gets through. So for a solar eclipse, the moon is blocking out the sun. For a lunar eclipse, essentially the Earth is stopping light from hitting the moon. So if, uh, you know, you sleep through Monday's eclipse, when is the next time that the Northeast will be in the line of totality the way it is this time? Yeah, so you definitely don't want to sleep through Monday's eclipse. <laughs> Go outside, definitely check it out. Um, but we have quite a while to wait for the next one. Uh, 2045 is when the path of totality is going to cross the country again, but it's not going to pass over New York State. If you want to be in New York State for another total eclipse, you have to wait until 2079 for that to happen. And it's just going to be uh, Long Island and a little bit of the southern tier of New York that gets it at that time. So what are you hoping to observe or see you know, scientifically speaking, during this happening? Yeah, so astronomers in general are really excited to observe the corona, um, to take a look at any solar flares or, or coronal events that are happening during the eclipse. 
Uh, and we're also excited to kind of look at how nature and weather reacts. There's going to be a lot of studies about how uh, the occurrence of the eclipse affects nature, how it might cause some weather and temperature changes nearby. Um, so all of those types of things are being studied. And we're studying them both from the perspective of totality as well as outside of totality. Granted, being outside of totality, the view is not as exciting, but we still will see some of these scientific effects, um, especially with nature and the world around us. So we're hoping just to learn a little bit more about how everybody, humans, plants, animals, are going to experience and be affected by this eclipse, along with all of the cool you know, photographs and real solar science that we can do as well. Can you explain why we need to wear special glasses? Oh, definitely. Yes, we all want to make sure that we're going to be very safe during this eclipse. Um, so as you all probably know, the sun is ridiculously bright. You know, on a normal day, if we glance quickly up at the sun, our brains tell us to instantly look away because it's just so bright. We are much more tempted to look at the sun during an eclipse because we know something cool is happening and we want to see it. So um, we have to make sure that we have safety glasses on, which block far more than 99.9999% of the sun's light and actually make it safe to see just a small amount of light and watch the moon cross in front of the sun. So we have to have those glasses on at any point that the sun isn't completely covered up by the moon. Do you know how long humans have been able to predict the arrival of an eclipse? That's a, a great question. So there have actually been records that go um, at least hundreds of years back, if not longer. Uh, we've been tracking solar eclipses for a long time with this idea of Sarah cycles and just paying attention to the motion of the stars and the motion of the sun in the sky. Uh, we've actually been able to kind of predict forward relatively closely for, for quite a while. I don't know exactly how, how long ago the first solar eclipse was predicted, um, but this is not something new. We've actually been observing the sky and trying to predict these phenomenon for a very long time. Dr. Valerie Rapson is a physics and astronomy professor at SUNY Oneonta. She spoke with WAMC's Ian Pickus. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Woolard. Technology developed for the visually impaired is bringing the solar eclipse to people who aren't otherwise able to see the astronomical event. What you're hearing is a demo of light sound posted to Harvard's website. The device emits a musical tone with pitch that changes with light intensity. The light sound project has a goal of building more than 750 handheld devices to be distributed free of charge to groups hosting eclipse events. One group using the device during the 2024 eclipse is UCP of Western Massachusetts in Pittsfield. The nonprofit serves people with all types of disabilities, including cerebral palsy. To learn more about the UCP of Western Massachusetts eclipse party and the light sound device, I spoke with organization CEO Randy Kinnis. So if you uh, have an impairment with vision or you're legally blind, you you can't see the, this eclipse. So we thought it was important that it, that anybody who wants to understand a little bit more about the, the eclipse or be part of this, this uh, you know, monumental event, if you will, um, has access to that. And so people who are blind, they now have access to this and they can be part of their day. It can be part of their calendar. They can, they can, they can come visit us and they can be involved in this, 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 you know, event that everybody's talking about. Yeah, and the light sound device itself is an interesting little unit. Uh, basically, when uh, a shadow passes in front of the device, in this case, the moon moving in front of the sun, uh, the pitch of the instrument actually dips. And then when Correct. the sunlight comes back, it goes back up. Now, have has UCP ever done an event like this before? Um, it, it, to my knowledge, no. This is our first time ever doing this event. And um, we we are really excited about it, and we, you know, obviously this can't be an annual event because this happens once in a while um, in, in, in various years. So it, this is has not been done. Are there any other events that are lined up uh, that either UCP is sponsoring or taking part in? Uh, maybe not exactly similar because the eclipse is such a rare event. Um, but other kinds of events that are also tailored and focused on being accessible to all. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And so we we are opening the door to many other ideas and thoughts around this because um, we we just felt that this this really resonated with people. We've had some really good feedback already. So um, we are going to start looking into do more little events like this. Um, you know, whether it has to do with um, any particular disability, we're not sure yet, but we're going to start, you know, putting our heads together and, and uh, looking at different opportunities to bring the community together in an inclusive manner. One of the things that we really are trying to do is to raise awareness in the community that there are people with differing abilities uh, all around us. And, and a great way to do that is through these, these little events. And so, again, getting back to um, this particular event, having people uh, in, in a uh, group setting um, that have differing abilities is really inclusive, and it's really something that we take pride in. Randy Kennis is CEO of UCP of Western Massachusetts. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. And now from the eclipse to Equus, horses, that is. According to a recent study from the American Horse Council, the horse industry supports more than 1.7 million jobs across the country. And career farriers, professionals trained in the art and science of horse hoof care, are in increasing demand. Paul Leonard is a professor at Mesa Lands Community College in New Mexico, which offers a program in farrier science. Professor Leonard spoke with the best of our knowledges, Jody Cowan. So farrier science is maintaining the health of a horse's uh, feet and legs. Um, there's an old saying that if no foot, no horse. And that I 100% that still applies. If that horse isn't healthy, you know, they can't use crutches. They can't use wheelchairs. If a horse doesn't have four legs under him, he's just not going to survive. So it's just the study and, the, and maintaining the health of a horse's lower legs. And, and as far as how it's changed, you know, we have more knowledge, maybe there's there's a technology that's available that's, a, you know, radiographs and different things, ultrasound machines that help you diagnose certain conditions that horses develop. But really, treatments and uh, I haven't really changed. You know, we're still building shoes out of steel. Uh, we still build some of our own shoes out of steel in a fire, just like the village blacksmith did. The difference is the village blacksmith probably used coal. We can use propane or we can use a, a product called coke, which is a byproduct of coal that burns a little bit cleaner. And, and the other thing that's changed is the availability of products on the market. People are even using uh, rubber horseshoes and glue on horseshoes and all kinds of new products that continually come on the market. But the critical part is an application, and the application is still fundamentally the same as it was back in the time period you're talking about. Whether from right there on campus or from the greater industry, where does the demand for this coursework come from? We have students come from all over the United States. We even have a couple of students from Canada and Australia. A lot of them are, are being recruited here. Mesa Lines has a real good rodeo team also, um, and a lot of the students are being recruited here on the rodeo team. But some of them come just purely just to shoe horses. The demand is there's still a lot of horses left all over the world that are still functional, usable. Some of them more for sport and pleasure. But there's still a lot of people in the world that make their living with a horse. And I can only speak for America. I haven't spent that much time out of the country. But in more rural America, you see people that make a living with horses, whether they're on a ranch or uh, some people still farm with a horse or or feed cattle with horses. In uh, more suburbia or metro type areas, you see more like the sport type horses, whether they're, you know, whether it's a race horse from hunter jumpers that you see in the Olympics to cutting horses and reining horses and rodeo horses. So there's just so many aspects to different what they use a horse for. 
What is today's updated look at farrier science and what skills can students learn throughout your course? So one of the key factors, I think, is horsemanship. Um, if you can't get along to, with a horse and relate to a horse and understand a little bit how a horse thinks, you're going to take a hard job and make it impossible. So I think horsemanship is probably the most critical thing that a person needs to learn and understand. And then after that, um, I, I just stress fundamentals, balancing the horse correctly, trimming and chewing correctly to a balanced foot. For each semester, how are horses provided? Is there a regular stable of horses that students have access to? We live in a rural community where there's lots of horses outside. The rural community brings horses into the college four days a week. We shoe those horses and trim those horses at a reduced price. That encourages the customers to bring the horses here, and um, it it gives our students lots of time to get hands-on on live horses. You can watch YouTube videos. You can get lectures. You can read a book, but horseshoeing is a lot of muscle memory, and the only way to develop muscle, muscle memory is to do the task that you're trying to do. So last semester... In a 16-week semester working four days a week, we had uh, about 157 horses come through the door at the college, and we averaged seven or eight to 10 students. They get quite a bit of time with hands-on live horses and a lot of one-on-one time with me as an instructor. Can I ask, why are the horseshoes themselves so important? I kind of touched on this briefly, but there's so many different varieties of horses, and there's so many different uses. So you shoe according to what the job would be for that particular horse. So for instance, if you've ever seen the Budweiser Clydesdales and they pull a huge wagon, well, those horses wear a huge shoe that's made out of thick steel because the horse weighs a lot and they're pulling a lot of weight. So a Budweiser Clydesdales might, they're probably pulling a wagon on the pavement. So pavement to a horse is slippery. Because a horse's foot is hard and the pavement's hard and pavement's real slippery. So you want some kind of traction device applied so that he doesn't slip and fall down when he's trying to pull something heavy. As opposed to the opposite end of a spectrum, like a, a, a racehorse wears a, a real light aluminum shoe with a traction device on the toe of the shoe to help that horse when he's really driving forward. You know, a racehorse is like a sprinter and a sprinter wears cleats, you know, a sprinter doesn't want to, or track shoes. A sprinter doesn't want to slip and fall when he's trying to take off out of the starting blocks. So a racehorse has a traction device on the toe of that shoe to help him get the traction in order to put all the power to the ground. So each shoe is specifically adapted to the job of the horse you're working on. Who would you consider to be the ideal farrier science student? The ideal student is a hardworking student that that wants to live in rural in the rural United States. These kids in rural communities, when they graduate high school, they go on to college, they get a college degree, and very few of them return back to these rural communities. So you have all this talent leaving these rural communities, and you don't have a lot of talent that that stays in the rural community. So I think horseshoeing gives a student an opportunity to work in a more rural type area and make a good living and uh, contribute back into his community. So it takes a hardworking student. It takes somebody that has a love for the animal. Somebody has a little bit of a pain tolerance because regardless of how good you are or how good you've been taught, you're going to smash your thumb with a hammer. You're going to, you know, you might get your toe stepped on by a horse. You have to be kind of a gritty kind of a person that can continue through that. What career paths are accessible through a completion of a farrier science course? Most farriers go on to be entrepreneurs and start their own business. I would say a huge percentage, I wouldn't begin to guess the percentage, but a huge percentage is just going to go out in the community, start their own business, and uh, become their own boss. I kind of liken it to like a plumber or an electrician. You would have a ideally like a work truck set up with all the tools you need. Uh, in the front of the truck, you would have your computer. You would drive to the job site, do the job get in the front of your truck, print out the the invoice, bill the customer, get the payment. You would operate just as if you were a contracting plumber or electrician. I have heard of other horseshoers that go on to work at uh, equine veterinary clinics or uh, or even work with other horseshoers and, and form more of a partnership or a corporation. That does happen, but but most horseshoers are sole proprietors. 
Is there any one particular aspect of teaching this course that you look forward to each semester? Um, my favorite part of the job is having my hands on live horses. Uh, I told you that I really emphasize the horsemanship. I love the satisfaction of having a horse that wants nothing to do with you and you're able to do some training and use some techniques and the horse learns to accept it and take it and, and becomes a, a better horse because of it. What might be the draw for students living, let's say, outside of the West or without exposure to Western arts to consider a career as a farrier? So in the topic of Western arts, uh, if you're an artistic person, you'll love the blacksmithing component. So blacksmithing, generally, I teach blacksmithing as a way to build a horseshoe to apply to a horse. But blacksmithing can be very artistic. If you ever watched uh, Forged in Fire, where they're building knives and swords, and but that's just one portion. I've seen people build gate latches and hinges, and you can build wagon wheels. I mean, before the 20th century, everything that was made out of metal was made by a blacksmith. So essentially there's, there's not much you can dream up that a really talented blacksmith can't build in a fire. So that's the artistic component. The college has a whole section here for arts and Western arts in particular, where they're building bits and spurs and, and Western type jewelry. In every state in the United States, there's a lot of horses. So I didn't mean to, to make it sound like, you know, in order to be a horseshoe, you need to be in the Western United States. I guess what I was getting to is there's different variations of horses and how they're used. And a lot of that is kind of regional. When a person is a really skilled farrier, if you decided you wanted to relocate to just about anywhere in the United States, you'd be able to support yourself and your family. That's one of the cool things about the job is if you have that skill, again, I related to being like a really great plumber, a really great electric electrician. When those guys, if if you needed, if you found, if you desire to relocate to Florida or New York or uh, Washington State, you can relocate you and your family and in a short period of time, put together a business that'll sustain you and your family. And I think that's one of the, probably one of the coolest things about shoeing horses. That's Paul Leonard, a professor at Mesa Lands Community College in New Mexico, speaking with the best of our knowledge's Jody Cowan. This has been The Best of Our Knowledge, Episode 1750. The Best of Our Knowledge is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Thanks to associate producer Jody Cowan, the latest on all national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter and our flagship station's website, wamc.org. Until next time, I'm Lucas Willard. <laughs>